The Common Health from the CSIS Bipartisan Alliance for Global Health Security, exploring how U.S. leadership can address our common health security challenges in this post-COVID moment. Hello and welcome to a new episode and the very first of our video version of the podcast, The Common Health Live. I'm Catherine Bliss with the CSIS Global Health Policy Center, and it's my pleasure to be here today with Ambassador John Nkingasong, U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and the head of the Bureau for Global Health Security and Diplomacy at the U.S. Department of State. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Ambassador Nkingasong led the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and joined our earlier podcast, Pandemic Planet, in 2020 or 2021 and 2022 to discuss his work coordinating with governments across the continent to respond and support each other during the outbreak. It's the end of November, which means it's almost December, which means the World AIDS Day, December 1st, is right around the corner. Ambassador Nkingasong, thank you for taking time out of what must be an incredibly busy World AIDS Week to talk with me today. Thank you. So this is PEPFAR's 20th year. There have been events and celebrations marking that milestone over the past 11 months. Now, historically, PEPFAR has been authorized by Congress at kind of five-year intervals in 2008, 2013, 2018, and with what has generally been bipartisan support. But this year has been a little bit different. PEPFAR's authorization expired on September 30th, and so far Congress has failed to reauthorize the program for another five years. In the House, PEPFAR initiatives have gotten tangled up with domestic politics around abortion access, and in both sides of Congress, the number of members who are knowledgeable about the program or who were even in office uh, for any of the previous authorizations has decreased significantly. So I want to start by asking you what your greatest concerns are for the program in this period now that the reauthorization deadline has passed. And if PEPFAR is not reauthorized for a multi-year period, what steps will need to be taken to address some of those challenges? Thank you, Katrin, for uh, having me once more on the program. And perhaps a good place to start this conversation is uh, to look back at where we are coming from. Uh, this is saying that uh, in order to move forward, it's always good to review where uh, the journey you've, you've come from. Let's look at 20 years ago, what the devastation that HIV AIDS was causing across the world, uh, especially in Africa, sub-Saharan African countries, uh, where the number of deaths were in the millions and where the number of new infections were in the millions. There was no treatment. A diagnosis for HIV, <clears throat> HIV AIDS meant life, a death sentence. We saw coffins and coffins around markets in Africa, along streets in Africa. I remember going to Uganda, going to Uganda when I landed at the airport in Entebbe, took a, a, a taxi to go to Kampala, the capital city. All you saw along the streets, that road, that highway, were coffins. I remember sitting in my office when I joined the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the, and was assigned to Ivory Coast, sitting in my office and looking over the infectious disease ward, which we shared with, that, um, uh, with the U.S. CDC campus there, seeing nothing other than loved ones that were dropped off at the parking lot at the parking lot because the beds were full of HIV patients and people would drive their loved ones in in uh, uh, tax taxis and just drop them off and one hour after they were all uh, uh, they, they, they were dead. We remembered scenes where grandmothers became care t caregivers to their grandchildren because the parents had died. That was HIV AIDS at that time and thanks to PEPFA, a program that started in a, with a bipartisan support in 2003, that nasty face of HIV that we saw 
which was an existential threat for most countries in Africa, had been taken care of. The fight is not over. You still have about 1.3 million new cases of HIV infections uh, reported just this year by the Joint United Nations Program on AIDS. It means we've made progress, but we still have a lot of work to do. I start there because it's important that that spirit of bipartisanship that had characterized PEPFA over the last 20 years is maintained. It's very important that our leadership, the United States leadership that has led the response against HIV in a significant way, in a way that we've not seen in the history of infectious diseases. PEPFA is the largest bilateral program that ever existed in solving one single disease. And we should be proud of that spirit of solidarity, the spirit of leadership, the very concrete impact that PEPFA has achieved over 20 years with saving 25 million lives, preventing HIV infection from infected mothers to children in about 5.5 million children. I say all of this to say that the journey ahead the fight against HIV AIDS is not over. Uh, we, collective we, as part of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, have agreed that, or committed rather, that we should bring HIV AIDS to an end by the year 2030 as a public health threat. We are six so short years away from 2030, and this is not a time to, to relent. If we relent, then the investments that we've put in into fighting HIV AIDS over the last 20 years will be compromised. The gains we've made in the fight against HIV AIDS is fragile. It's fragile because the millions of people that are currently receiving life-saving treatment, if they do not continue taking those drugs, HIV will come back. And in the next two years or so, millions of people will be dying of HIV and HIV will be transmitted again and will bring us back to where we were 20 years ago. So you've really emphasized the numbers of lives saved, of infections prevented, and the fact that so many millions of people are now you know, living longer lives, living with access to antiretroviral therapies. So that means they're getting older, they're you know, perhaps also needing care for, for other kinds of infections and, or, or just chronic diseases that, that are you know, associated with, with becoming older. I wanted to ask you about the kind of global financing around the HIV response because as you know we look at the number of perhaps new infections but also the number of people who will really need to be maintained on on medication you know if you look at the financing trends for global health the amount of overseas development assistance going for HIV has largely remained steady mm -hmm. even as the percentage of that has gone down um, over the course of the pandemic. You know, we saw that uh, in 2021, out of 67 uh, something billion dollars in development assistance for health, 9.91 billion went to HIV. And of course, U.S. funding accounted for nearly half of that sum, both through bilateral and, and multilateral programs. That seems like a lot of money. But is that enough to really reach that goal of ending HIV as a public health threat by 2030 and really maintaining people you know, in programs that can really enable them to live long, productive, and healthy lives? That's a very good question, Catherine, because we live in a world that is, we are currently faced or challenged with competing priorities, both in the areas of climate change, food insecurity, the wars, uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, and now the war in, in the Middle East, is a combination of all of these factors that is making physical space very challenging for countries, partner countries that PEPFI works with. I visited a country recently, and I was told that 90% of that country's uh, 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 income goes in servicing debts. So it doesn't leave those, those countries with a lot of maneuver to invest in, in HIV uh, response. Again, the point I want to make here is that the fight against HIV AIDS is not over. And this is not time to be complacent. This is not time to leave our foot off the pedal. Because if we do that, 
uh, the investments we've made over the years will be completely compromised. We are very close. We are indeed very close. So many countries are making progress towards achieving the goals set up by the Joint United Nations Program, UNAIDS. That is the goal to achieve, make sure that 95% of people who are infected know their status, 95% of those who know their status are on treatment, and 95% of those suppress their virus below the level of detection. I think we should continue to uh, encourage the global community as a whole, uh, not just the United States, but the global community to not relent. Uh, we've come a long way. We've come a long way, and we can almost see the end of this fight if we just focus on the right things to do, which is commitment to uh, the cause in fighting HIV AIDS. So one of the things you mentioned was fiscal space for countries to really allocate their own domestic resources mm. for health re for health programs broadly and for HIV response in particular. Now, earlier this year, the Department of State launched the new bureau that you had, the Bureau of Global Health Security and Diplomacy, and that really united a number of different offices and units that had previously been dispersed through, through different, I guess, entities or departments mm. throughout the department. Um, now that the Bureau has been launched, do you see U.S. diplomacy around uh, domestic and donor financing for HIV programs kind of evolving? You know, how do you see that taking shape and how will the diplomacy around HIV and health security financing kind of take shape in the next phase of work? I think the United States has been a leader in uh, supporting the fight against HIV AIDS. We are the largest contributor as part of the, the, uh, the Global Fund to fight HIV, TB, and malaria. We are the largest contributor in the new fund that has just been established, the Pandemic Fund. Uh, the fund is still early. That is the Pandemic Fund. is still early. That is currently housed at the World Bank. And our hope is that We'll continue to use diplomacy, the Bureau will continue to lead with diplomacy and rally others around the importance of growing that fund to the expected $10 billion a year. If you recall, when the fund, pandemic fund was established, the goal was to get to $10 billion a year for the next five years. We are currently around $1.9 billion, <clears throat> and I remain hopeful that with the United States leadership, leading with diplomacy and rallying other countries around the importance of what this fund means, it's not just a fund, but it is a way to protect ourselves, the collective selves, as part of global health security. We saw what the COVID-19 pandemic did. Within two months, 165 countries were affected. Within a short two months, that just shows you the interconnectivity that we are as human species, as humankind, it shows you how quickly a virus can spread. A disease outbreak anywhere in the world is a threat everywhere in the world, including the United States. So using our diplomacy to enable countries to cooperate more, to collaborate, to coordinate efforts is key. And that is what the Bureau will strive to do. So you'll be working through the Pandemic Fund, the Global Fund, and of course, bilateral and regional programs. Um, I wanted to kind of drill down to the country level a little bit. So last year, right around World AIDS Day, the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator released, I guess, the new PEPFAR strategy that really set out a process by which countries would start to be asked to develop measurable sustainability mm -hmm. roadmaps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, PEPFAR has had different approaches to the sustainability question mm -hmm. over time. But I wanted to ask you to say a little bit about how the development of those roadmaps has taken shape over the past year, how the approach is a little bit different from some of the approaches to sustainability in the past, and what you're hearing from countries as they kind of undertake this process of planning and thinking about mobilizing those domestic resources to really begin to, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of move to toward 2030 and, and beyond in a sustainable way. I think in a very uh, simple manner, we have to step back and ask the qu ourselves the questions, 
two questions. What is it that we must do that will carry us to 2030, which is a year we've agreed that will bring HIV AIDS to an end as a public health threat? So that is imp important. Secondly is what do we do past 2030? I mean, assuming that we are very successful, right, in getting, uh, achieving our goals by the year 2030, Past 2030, there will be millions of people that will wake up in the morning every day requiring to take one pill that is a treatment for, for HIV AIDS that has enabled them to, be product, to live productive lives, carry on with their businesses, take care of their families. We have to think of, uh, through that. That means we have to be very transparent with the way we, we, we approach the question of sustainability and say, what is the political leadership <clears throat> of the partner countries that we are supporting or uh, doing? In other words, well, how does political sustainability look like? We started off this conversation by acknowledging the journey we've worked and the tremendous success or successes that we've had. But because of that, HIV AIDS is no longer so visible in the political checkerboard. And because of that, I don't think that partner countries or globally, we've seen clinics or hospitals full of HIV patients. So because of that, it has dropped by one or two notches down. Second is the programmatic sustainability. What do we do to address those inequity gaps that exist in children? adolescent girls and young young women, and in key populations, so that we get to 2030 by closing those gaps. Because if we do not close those gaps and we keep treating people, uh, you just get a large number of people that will be requiring of treatment even past 2030, right? So I call it the, the tap, the kitchen sink analogy. You turn off the tap while you, you mop in the floor. That's what we should be aiming at. Then lastly is the financial sustainability, which is to say that this is what the international community is bringing to the table. The countries must mobilize their own domestic financing so that we sustain the, the response. I call it joint responsibility and joint accountability, which is to say that we are not suggesting that the sustainability roadmap implies we are packing and leaving the countries is rather that we recognize what is it that we want the problem we want to solve and then develop the right partnerships to get us to where we, we have to be those are the three elements that should characterize any conversation around sustainability i.e political sustainability that is leadership uh, programmatic sustainability and lastly financial sustainability i'm very encouraged when I traveled in many countries, and I've done so in about 11 countries this year, where uh, I see countries voluntarily saying, look, ambassadors, take our words, we are going to increase our domestic financing. I was in Nigeria recently in September, and the vice president just voluntarily said, we are going to increase our domestic financing for her, including for HIV. I was in Cameroon, and the minister of finance just said, take we stay we, we keep with our commitment we are going to increase our domestic financing and so it was in Eswatini where the prime minister said watch our numbers we're going to increase our financing to about 60 percent and so was in Mozambique so the conversation is ripe to have a very transparent and honest discussion as to what do we do between now and 2030 and then what do we do past 2030. So it sounds like it really has to be a partnership that is kind of or a set of decisions discussions and plans that are tailored for each country that there may be some broad um a broad framework of you know thinking about the financing the community engagement and and the the issues around political leadership but ultimately those decisions will will depend on on a country's situation its history and and its current trajectory you mentioned that equity is at the core of the new strategy and, and many of the discussions around sustainability. And of course, in East and Southern Africa, at least 25% of new infections are among adolescent girls and young women who make up a much smaller percentage of the population. 
And unfortunately, they are often at the age where they're least likely to be really intersecting with the health system. And so frequently don't know their status. I just wanted to ask you to say a little bit more about how PEPFAR is working with countries, NGOs, and the private sector to reach that population with prevention, testing, and treatment options. And if you could say a little bit about the steps that you see will need to be taken in, in the kind of the next six years and, and beyond with respect to the DREAMS initiative and other programs really focusing on this critical population. The population you just described, that is adults and girls and, and young women, uh, constitutes a, a key segment of the population that uh, <clears throat> we have to deal with if we have a chance of, of winning the battle against HIV AIDS. Um, the rate of new, <clears throat> new infections is about uh, six times higher in that age group for women in some countries than in the corresponding age in, in uh, uh, young men and, and, and adolescent boys. So I think we have to admit that as we make progress into the fight against HIV AIDS, what we call uh, the low hanging fruits will be more challenging. And this young, the young people that you just described, it, it didn't necessarily see how nasty HIV AIDS was 20 years ago or 25 years ago. They didn't see that ugly face of, of HIV. So we have to be very intentional and use all and be innovative in the way that we approach that population. We are very fortunate that we have a series of tools in our disposition now, a treatment, uh, we have a, a, a prep, pre a, a, a exposure prophylaxy, and we have usual prevention campaigns like the Dreams program is part of what I call a combination approach, right? That we have in our disposition to fight HIV/AIDS, especially amongst young young people. The Dreams program has been very successful uh, because it targets an empowered young women and adolescent girls in their community. And we've seen in many countries, including in South Africa that you mentioned and other countries, how that age group or the dreamers, as I call them, have actually made very good progress, very good progress. They have empowered, they speak freely, and because of that, they are champions and leaders in their own community. Uh, I've been to several countries and visited with them, including in Tanzania, in uh, uh, South Africa, and, and uh, Kenya. And it's, I'm very, very impressed with that. It's the kind of innovation along the lines of the Dreams-like program that we need to develop more and target it, but be more intentional in engaging with the youths. And the youths will argue that uh, nothing about us without us, mm -hmm. which is a slogan I like a lot. And we will be launching a youth initiative at, at PEPA, which is really designed to bring the youth leadership in there, sit down with them and design the program or co-create the program that are destined for the youth population then. It's going to be complex, but it's something we have to do because as you rightly said, the rate of new infections is significantly higher in that age group than in other groups. Well, thinking about kind of changes in terms of, you know, kind of where infections are, the recent UN AIDS data also shows that while most <clears> new <throat> HIV AIDS cases and deaths are still concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa, recent years have also seen an increase in cases in Western Europe, Central Asia, and the Philippines, among other countries. And so I wanted to ask you to say a little bit about PEPFAR's work in some of the regions that haven't always been focus areas in the past. How uh, is or will the program adapt uh, its programming or work with partners to kind of share, uh, share techniques and approaches and mm -hmm. ideas to address a change in infections in some of these newer regions? The, <clears throat> the, the strength of PEPFAR, or one of its strengths, I would say, is that it is a data-driven, evidence-based uh, 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 program, and has been over the years. And when you look at PEPFAR's presence in the world, I mean, we are in 55 countries. Majority of those countries are in Africa, but we also have programs in Philippines, in Southeast Asia, in many countries. 
If you look at Philippines, for example, over the last couple of years, the rate of new infections have increased over 200 percent, and that is very, very concerning. We just did our regional uh, uh, program uh, planning, and we hope to continue to use data in those regions to understand what is driving the increase in that region of the world, that is Southeast Asia. But what is uh, also true is that in those other regions outside of Africa, the epidemic is driven essentially by men who have sex with men and young people, young people. So regardless of where you are, whether you are in Africa or in Southeast Asia, the rate of new infections is in the young people. Whether you had a young person, a young man who have sex with man, or a young African who engage in uh, other forms of sexual behavior, the story is the same. I mean, young people are vulnerable. So we must target that group. In other words, we must bring them in and make them leaders and champions in the communities that they serve so that they can become the real uh, 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 implementers of these programs. It's not just about conceiving the programs and then feeding that into the young population in the communities. My uh, uh, strategy would be to make sure that we sit around the table and co-create and conceive the programs with the youth so that we fully understand where to get the youth and where to find them. I was in, uh, in Namibia just a few months ago and, a young, and talked to a young person and in a round table setting and he said, uh, you guys don't understand how we communicate. Okay, we communicate differently, and, and that is very, very important. If we make them champions, then I'm sure they are going to be uh, 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 the, the, the leaders in their communities that will guide us as to how to effectively implement programs that will address the, 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 the need for and tackle the, the rising uh, cases of new infections in those communities. So it sounds like there may be opportunities as well for greater communication kind of across the different countries among youth groups and others to really share experiences and, and work together to create new approaches. No, absolutely. Regardless, as I said, where you are is the young people. Okay. And, and I think we should just uh, keep that in mind in our planning as we drive towards uh, 2030 uh, to bring HIV AIDS as an end to a public health trend. So World AIDS Day is this, this week. World, the week is all about this, but, but December 1st is the day. And the theme this year is Let Communities Lead. And at an event a couple of weeks ago at the Council on Foreign Relations, you and Anthony Fauci were having a conversation, you know, really, I think, looking back on the history of the HIV response globally, but also looking at the COVID-19 pandemic and really... Mm -hmm kind of talking about the importance of community engagement that, you know, if communities were not had not been part of that pandemic response, that things could have been even more challenging in many places than they were. So I wanted to ask you to reflect kind of more broadly, kind of beyond the, the work with youth that, that is so important this year, but why is it important that organizations of communities of, of people living with or at risk of HIV really, you know, have a leading voice in designing policies? And, you know, how can we ensure that future pandemics keep that lesson in mind? Mm -hmm. And so it's not something that that has to be kind of re relearned each time we enter that cycle. Yeah. HIV has offered a lot for all of us uh, who are in global public health to draw a lot of lessons in. And some of those lessons include what I call uh, sustained leadership, partnerships, developing the right partnerships, and of course, leading with data and, and science. And the community plays a critical role in this, and community in its broader sense, which including the faith-based organizations. Uh, the civil society, and just the young people that we, we, we just described. There's a saying that it starts in the community and it ends in the community. The HIV response taught us that without using the whole of community approach, the whole of community approach, i.e. if we are in a certain community, the faith-based organization must be engaged, the civil society, the activists must be, in, be engaged. That's the only way that you can truly address the, the issues of a disease threat such as H HIV or 
the COVID uh, response that uh, pandemic that we just uh, had uh, to deal with. So our strategy, if you look at the five years strategic plan that we launched last year, has as a cross-cutting element community leadership. Not community engagement, community leadership, which is that you place the communities at the center of, of the response. You co-create with the communities, you listen to the communities, and I think that's what we, have, we are promoting actively. We believe that if we do that, then the communities will be able to get to the last mile and make a strong case as to why people should come out, know their status, why people should be put on treatment or receive their treatment and why they should maintain a, a virus that is below detectable levels. I think those lessons can be applied to other emerging infections or other outbreaks. Who knows what the future is? We've all said that it is a question of when a new disease outbreak will occur and not if it will occur. And if it does, I think the community plays a role. We saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, or at least in my experience, uh, leading the COVID response in Africa, that the faith-based organizations were the megaphone of trust in the community. Uh, especially when vaccines, the COVID vaccines became available, uh, it, 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 there was a lot of hit, uh, 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 hesitancy and the churches or the mosques went in and called on people to come get their vaccines. And you saw a long line of, of worshippers after the services, whether they were in a mosque or the church, whining and meandering out to get the vaccine, which was not true when the government was doing that all by themselves. So the community have always played a critical role in the HIV response and will continue to if we have to get to the last mile, but there are lessons we must learn to prepare us to fight other uh, disease outbreaks. So it sounds like with political leadership or building partnerships, uh, kind of demanding transparency around financial issues, building confidence in uh, either countermeasures or, or government guidance, that the community has a critical role to play in both uh, building advocacy, but also confidence and community support for for initiatives, whether for HIV or, or other other pandemics. As you, this is kind of a, a last question asking, we started out kind of looking back over 20 years, but as you as you look back over the past two decades, and of course ahead to 2030 and beyond, and even taking into account some of the uncertainties around reauthorization and, and the murky kind of financial picture globally in terms of the the allocation of funds. Just wanted to ask you what aspects of the global effort to end HIV give you the greatest hope and where you will really be looking for, for progress and, and change over the next few years. The journey of HIV AIDS uh, has been a journey of hope. And we started off this conversation by recognizing the strong bipartisan support that PEPFAR had, have enjoyed over the last 20 years. And that is a story of hope. When so many people in the world were hopeless, PEPFAR offered hope. So going forward, I remain hopeful that that strong bipartisanship that has characterized PEPFAR and has come to symbolize our values the values of what people, the, the people of the United States bear and have shared their generosity of heart with the rest of the world will prevail. That despite the challenging conversations we've all had around the question of reauthorization, a clean reauthorization for five years, that everyone will step back, look at the progress we've made together, look at the values that we've promoted across the world, the values that speak to our ability to care for others and say, we have to get this fight done, completed in the next, uh, 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 or the journey to 2030. And an important element of that is the hope that PEPFAR will be reauthorized in a clean manner for the next five years so that we engage and accelerate our response to bringing HIV AIDS to an end. So it's hope around what we've done over the last 20 years and hope that we can bring this epidemic to an end and the history books when they are written i hope that the cover page will be hiv is a journey of hope and pepfar 
and the bipartisan nature of what we've done over the years will characterize a big chapter of that book. Well, Ambassador John and Kingasong, U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and Head of the Bureau for Bureau of Global Health Security and Diplomacy. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today and share your perspective on this journey of hope over the past 20 years and, and into the future. I hope that we'll be able to meet again over the coming months to discuss the state of PEPFAR as its new decade is underway. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Sir.